Shove it, man! Welcome back to the Shove It Show. Just one small thing before we start today's video. We haven't got long left for the Baroud fundraiser. I know I said I wouldn't mention it again, but we're literally just £240 short of our goal. Surely we can make that happen. Anything extra will also be nice and will be used to fund the documentary I'm making on his trip. Imagine Baroud smashed out of his face clotheslining locals in a Bridgewater Bay bar. Which leads me on nicely to today's video, which is also a documentary. I'm usually just the king of the gut punch, but apparently I'm good at segues too. I poke a lot of fun at TNA on this channel, but it's easy to forget the good stuff that they did. Let me introduce you all to British Boot Camp. Now most of my viewers are in the US, so I have no idea if you guys caught this program or not. But it was actually really, really good. If you've seen it before, let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Boot Camp was a reality TV program aired in 2013 and also got a second season in 2014. And we all know if something sucks, it usually doesn't get a second season. This show aired on Challenge TV in the UK who had a good relationship with TNA and it's just 30 minute episodes. JB Jeremy Borash was heavily involved in this project and it came at a time when TNA was pretty big in the UK. The aim of the show was of course to find a new wrestler for the TNA roster to represent the large British audience. Anyway, enough backstory. For once I'm really looking forward to watching this back. British Boot Camp, did it light up the new talent like a lamp? The show starts with Dixie and Hogan discussing the upcoming show. Dixie forces Hogan to agree that the winner of the show will earn a TNA contract. Dixie introduces the four British wrestlers who will be competing on the show. Unfortunately, they don't give us any information on how the wrestlers were selected in the first place. Marty Skrull was the first man up. We get interviews with Magnus who reveals that he's his best friend in the wrestling business. So is this a case of it's not what you know, it's who you know? Marty also calls him Hoke Hogan, so it's not just me. He has a partying gimmick. Marty reveals how hard he's had to work to get to this stage being brought up in a single parent family. He is the life and soul of every party. The next man we meet is Rockstar Spud. He doesn't have his pompadour hairstyle at this point but he is wearing girls makeup. Spud reveals that he looked up to Hogan and he's the one who made him want to be a wrestler. But he may just be kissing his ass. Hogan responds by telling us that Spud said his prayers and ate his vitamins. Because Magnus is English, he talks about Spud. He says he works hard but it doesn't sound like these two are best friends, poor Spud. Spud goes on to make fun of people who are plumbers and electricians, two jobs which can make you minted in the UK, so I wouldn't say that job is anything to make fun of. Last but not least, we meet the two final competitors who are the Blossom Twins. They have a twin gimmick and nothing else. What's interesting is they both have already wrestled for two years in TNA's developmental territory OVW, so I guess this is a second chance for them. This is not really mentioned throughout the documentary, not sure why. They film at their home in Stockport. It looks like a trap house and it wouldn't surprise me in Stockport. It's then revealed that both girls are teaching assistants on the side. The family are very proud of the girls. The girls being competitors confused me at the time. Are they being counted as a single entity? Dixie tells the foursome that boot camp will start tomorrow. They will be looked after by a British wrestling legend. Hogan tells them to pack their bags, Jack. At a fan party, they get to cut promos on each other and this is where the rivalry starts. Spud and Marty reveal that they don't like each other for real. Marty tells Spud there's two people who wear sunglasses indoors, blind people and wankers. So all four decide to go out on a night out in London. It's revealed at this point that Spud has a bit of a drinking problem. It feels like the two guys are trying to out alpha each other in front of the girls. These two girls seem very well brought up and out of place with these two partying idiots. They all start arguing because the guys are drunk and wandered off. Marty wants to party but the girls are being a buzzkill. Spud also doesn't want a babysitter, despite being the size of someone who would normally need one. The girls are even more horrified when the boys slash in the street. So this real life crime is shown on telly. Their night out really isn't going well as they don't even make it to a club as Rockstar Spud is too drunk. They head home but then they argue in the limo about Twitter followers and also about dating shows. It sounds like Marty and Spud were both on dating shows. I think Spud was on Snog Marry Avoid and Party Marty was on that one where they go no likey no lighty. Can't remember the name of it. Screw it. This goes on for quite a while as Marty is convinced that he's a bigger star than Spud due to having double the Twitter followers. Spud snaps and hits Marty in the limo. It's only 10.38pm at this point but they're already screaming profanities at each other in the street. Spud wanders off and carries on drinking and the other three leave him. For a man called Party Marty you might think he'd be the other way around. The night ends with Spud drinking on his own like a sad old man. The next morning three of the guys are fine but Rockstar Spud is still clothed in bed looking rough. They'll get to meet their mentor now, it's Rollable Rocco. Hogan talks about how great Rocco is. Would he have even crossed paths with him? Surely not. Rocco's wrestling career was certainly before my time but he was big in the UK world of sports wrestling scene and he was known for his matches in Japan with Tiger Mask. He retired in 1991 but seeing as this is a British TV programme I guess some people would remember him. I mean those people would be older than their target demographic. He certainly wasn't on US telly. 
I don't know, I'm rambling. We'll find out if he brings anything to this show. Rollerball gives them 10 minutes to prepare for their first training session. Spud no-shows it and is found puking behind a dumpster. That's how episode 1 ends, so I guess the cliffhanger is will Rockstar Spud be kicked off the show? Let's find out. Episode 2 picks up where we left off. Spud admits to Rocco that he was out drinking. Rocco tells him he's throwing his career away and forces him to join the others in the ring. The Blossoms are up first as they show what they're made of. The guys say that they're actually better than they realised. The girls then fuck something up and Rocco tells them off and forces them to go again. One of the Blossom throws a drop kick but she lands on her ankle. So we now have an injury ankle on their very first training session. Yes, yeah, seems legit. They opt to carry on. Rocco tells them that they're very talented and it shows their dedication because the show must go on if you get injured. The boys are up next and Dixie doubts them because of what happened on their night out. Spud admits Marty is a great wrestler but he still thinks he's a dick. Marty decides to try and school the hungover Rockstar Spud and embarrass him as much as possible. Marty doesn't let Spud show what he's able to do. Rockstar Spud's too humiliated and he storms out the ring. He screams at Rocco calling him an old man. They run into a car park. It looks like a parent chasing after their badly behaved kid in Asda. Walmart. Rocco gets Spud in the ring and now he beats him up. Rocco respects him in the end because Spud refused to tap out. Rocco now has to decide if any of them get the green light to continue in the competition. He decides to let them all through. Seems like a nice old man. We move on to something completely different now. The wrestlers will have to take part in media sessions with actual UK newspapers and radio stations. The newspaper guy tells the Blossoms that women are only eye candy in wrestling. He's just trying to wind the wrestlers up and get them to snap in front of the media. He asks Party Marty if he's ever managed to lay either of the Blossom twins. Marty reveals he likes Hannah Blossom. The radio station also follows the same route, asking about if either of the men have got it on with the Blossoms. Marty says again he thinks Hannah likes him. Starting to feel sorry for the Blossoms, they seem so innocent and they have to deal with these two morons. Everyone's trying to sexualise them and they don't want to do it. The Sun newspaper sits down to talk with the wrestlers. The Blossoms say what a great women's role model Dixie Carter is. Party Marty then gets told off for saying that Dixie's fit and he'd sleep with her. This probably scored Marty some points with Dixie who was known for liking wrestlers. You know, it's funny that this rumour has persisted for years but nobody has actually come forth and admitted it. You'd think someone would have by now, maybe it isn't true. Marty is branded as being an idiot. Borash says the next challenge is to see what they can do on the microphone at Progress Wrestling. Really nice crowd for this Progress Wrestling event, really vocal. Rockstar Spud is booed out the building before he even says a word. He cuts a heel promo and it works. The Blossoms admit that they are bad mic skills so I'm interested to see what they have to say. Unfortunately Spud takes their microphone away. He calls them glorified ring rats. They snatch the mic back and make a small penis joke at him. They're very angry about being called ring rats. Marty revealed that it turned him on when Hannah got angry. Marty's the last guy and the crowd were already very happy to see him. He has a bottle of beer. He tells Spud you have to be over the age of 14 to get into the building in the first place. Jeremy Borash surveys the crowd to find out who was the best on the microphone. Marty clearly wins the cheers for the fans. Spud is angry and challenges Marty to a match right now but then he runs off. Spud will not wrestle in front of 300 drunk idiots and Marty needs to wait for the Wembley Arena. As someone who was at that Wembley Arena show, I can tell you that it was 10,000 drunk idiots. Borash is impressed with their mix of skills. As episode 2 ends, the wrestlers say goodbye to their families. They're jetting off to the States. Well, Spud doesn't say goodbye because nobody likes him. So on to the third episode, we start with a photo shoot. The girls look taller than both the guys. They catch a flight to Phoenix, Arizona. Spud's doing Jaeger bombs before he's even made it onto the plane. Spud's luggage bag is broken, he throws a tantrum like a little girl. The wrestlers will be attending a TNA fan show. They aren't excited about meeting any of the wrestlers, they only want to meet the fans. The first wrestler they get to meet is Christy Hemi. Spud tells her that Marty has a poster of her on his bedroom wall and then he makes the wanker hand symbol. <laughs> She's not impressed. The fans only want to take pictures with the twins. And when I say fans, I mean overweight virgins who live in their mum's basements. Party Marty is very happy when a girl finally wants to have a picture with him, but she looks like she had a haircut of a knife and fork. We're now at Sting's Hall of Fame induction. Everybody's dressed up all smart. Marty is still trying it on with Hannah Blossom. Her twin is upset because she wanted them to sit together. Kurt Angle is here now and he sits on the table with the British Boot Camp contestants. Spud makes Kurt laugh. He's got a rip in his jacket but he tells Kurt it happened when he strained too hard. Look, there's Lex Luger for a quarter of a second. We spend the next few minutes just seeing Sting's Hall of Fame induction. Dixie meets the wrestlers and then the icon Sting walks up with the Hulkster. The wrestlers now look like they're bricking themselves. Dixie tells the guys that they need to start taking this more seriously. They look like little boys being told off by the head teacher. Marty doesn't hit on her either, so he's all talk. I get a vibe that Dixie's playing favourites with the Blossom Twins. She just seems warmer to them. 
The wrestlers are united now and vow to give it their best. Another photo shoot up next. Marty and Spud are still messing around with each other. Spud starts getting annoyed with the ladies for spending too long with their makeup. We're now at Bound for Glory 2012. The wrestlers are marched into Dixie Carter's office. She compares Bound for Glory to the FA Cup final. <laughs> Who gave her that line? She has arranged for the wrestlers to have front row seats and they will be shown on pay-per-view. As they walk backstage, the wrestlers start to get nervous when they see how many people are employed to work on the TNA show. Spud says although every seat is empty, he can still hear the fans chanting his name. That's a bit worrying. They're on the pay-per-view show now. The guys try to be as energetic as possible when the camera focuses on them for a few seconds, but the girls just blow a kiss. These two need a personality transplant. Off we go to Nashville, Tennessee now. Borash picks them up in a limo and says it's time to see Dixie again. They're all nervous and say, is there anything we should avoid saying to her? They've met her before, what's wrong with them? They arrive at TNA headquarters, which Dixie is very proud of. The episode ends. This was the worst episode so far because it was less about reality TV and the contestants and more about making TNA look as good as possible. The fourth episode starts with Dixie telling the girls that she's hooked the girls up with a makeover. <laughs> How insulting. Can they make over their personalities, please? The stylist says she has to update their looks. Rockstar Spud says they look pretty fit now. Dixie joins them in a limo to inspect their makeover. They now go on to a restaurant which has celebrity faces on the wall. Of course, Dixie's one of them. Marty says he's never drank red wine before. He's not sophisticated like the Hawk. For episode four, the contestants are gonna be reviewed by Dixie on their performance on camera at Bound for Glory. They were literally on TV for five seconds. How much can she possibly have to say? She tells Marty off for chewing gum on camera and says he doesn't look like a star. What is she on about? Wrestlers chew gum on camera all the time. Dixie says Spud got the most attention, but he wasn't acting like a rock star. He was acting like an idiot. Dixie reveals that she thinks she knows who's going to win the competition, which makes them all nervous. They see the sights of Nashville now, which is pretty boring. But what's coming up next is the cowboy taking them on a pub crawl, so that should be good. They get to watch James Storm beating Brood in a bar whilst they continue drinking. They start doing shots with the cowboy. The girls are trying not to drink because they're boring. Storm likes Rockstar Spud the best because he wants to have fun and not pretend to be anyone he isn't. We get a mechanical bull ride now. Marty looks out of it at this point. Spud is surprisingly determined but he lasts about a second on the bull. As the girls have a go, Marty's doing commentary saying they're used to riding bulls. The boys want to visit a new karaoke bar now, but of course the girls refuse to go. What buzz kills. At this point, Marty finally manages to get a kiss from Hannah Blossom. She has lost her voice and finally looks as drunk as the guys. I guess she's the evil twin. Her sister doesn't want to look at her acting this way. The drink continues with Storm as Spud gargles whiskey. Spud is now almost naked on the bar and he's dragged out by a bouncer. The next day, the contestants will head off to OVW, which is TNA's developmental territory, although it didn't really develop anything. They will be trained by Al Snow and Doug Williams. Spud is scared of Al Snow. Douglas is happy to see the guys. Snow interrogates them forever about why they want to be doing wrestling so badly. Doug starts their training now and tells them that the US ring is a bit bigger than they're used to. Snow has to teach them how to run the ropes because they're struggling. The boys are up next and Al Snow gives them a long list of things that they need to do. See, this is why the Hawk could never make it as a wrestler. I can barely get my mind out of the gutter, let alone remember basic instructions. That ends episode 4. Episode 5 starts with Rockstar Spud complaining that there isn't enough experienced legends training wrestlers in the UK, so he's glad to see Doug. They have to have matches in OVW. Spud teams up with Party Marty Skull. Before the match, Spud agrees to let Marty finish the match of his new move. They are tag team partners who don't get on. It's hard to tell, but I think they face a man called Eddie Diamond and Raphael Constantine. Two complete ham and eggers, so congratulations on this exposure, lads. Marty is selfish and he's not letting Spud do anything. He hits some shoulder tackles and eventually brings Spud in with a double axe. This is not full match footage, it looks to be a very basic match that they're having. Marty definitely shines the most in this one. Spud does a Rick Rude net breaker. Then the big moment of the match, Spud doesn't tag his partner in and finishes the match himself. So Spud's a dick because Marty wanted to get his new move over. Al Snow tells Spud off for his selfish actions and they yell at him to leave. The Blossoms are next and interestingly they're taking on some jobber Bolt and Taylor Hendricks. The twins beat up Bolt for a while. They also hit a double backdrop to Taylor. From the brief highlights the girls work together really well and they win the match. Al Snow tells them to work as a team even more and thanks them for their match. The contestants will now be judged by Al Snow and Doug Williams on their matches. Snow tells Marty off for just doing his entrance around the ring instead of in it. Because he's short fans will be able to tell that he's short when they're stood next to him. Makes sense. Al Snow then strangely tells the girls to not lose their femininity and stop wrestling like men. What does he want them to do? Rub their asses in people's faces? Strange advice. Doug wants to see more aggression from the girls. Last but not least is Rockstar Spud. They're still unhappy of him because of his actions. 
Snow says they might not be able to trust him. They do like his entrance, however. Despite that, they agree to send all four of them onto the next step. Spud looks like he's dumping in his nappy of fear. On to Orlando we go. We get interviews with some of the wrestlers now, and Jeff Hardy, Tarrant around Samoa Joe all like Party Marty the best. Mickey James revealed that she asked Dixie Carter to hire the twins in the past. Bully Ray actually likes Rockstar Spud because he says he has balls. He ends that interview by saying Spud could be his bastard son. Things go on hold for a moment now as the Blossoms have to get another makeover. Tonight, they will all be having a match on Impact. Before their match on Impact, they're joined by Rocco again via video link. He tells Marty he's a born wrestler and he has his best hopes on him. He says Spud has spirit and he'll go a long way. The girls have raw talent and calls them beautiful. Not sure if that's with or without constant makeovers. Dixie spends some more time with the contestants before the match. She tells them to make their country proud. The girls will be facing Gail Kim and Madison Rain, so that match is going to suck. Dixie decides that the men will face each other due to all their hatred for each other. Marty doesn't want to do it because he thinks their styles clash. She tells them that the executives and the Hulks will all be watching their matches and will find out who wins British Boot Camp after that. Not much pressure then. Okay, episode 6, the finale. Who's going to win? If you had to ask me who's done the best so far, I'd say Rockstar Spud definitely has the most character. He's shown that throughout the show, despite being shown as a bit of a dickhead. The show starts with Hulk Hogan flexing frantically as he shakes with excitement about British Boot Camp. What are you going to do when TNA Impact Wrestling picks you? For this show, Magnus will be on commentary with JB. Damn, I wanted some Taz factoids. I think we'll be getting full match footage here. The men's match will be up first. It's Rockstar Spud who certainly makes the most of his entrance. They cut to Hogan backstage who remarks that Spud looks like a movie star. He of course takes on Party Marty's girl. Marty's full of energy and he's taken the advice to do more of his entrance in the ring. Marty spins out of Spud's armbar and he lifts him overhead and puts on one of his own. Hogan and Dixie keep cutting into the commentary with their input. Marty hits a big shoulder knockdown. Spud then does a float over in the corner and he celebrates and when he turns around Marty thrusts at him and slaps him. Marty gives Spud a drop toe hold and a basement drop kick to the face. Marty now hits Spud for a big dive to the outside of the ring by the ring post. They show Angle and Hardy looking bored in the crowd. Dude, that guy rocks just Spud, man. He better not steal my swanton bomb finishing maneuver, man, or I'm going back to Carolina. And I'm going to tell my stoner friend Shannon all about you, Spud. Spud eventually slows him down with some heel offense. He then hits a flying somersault plancher to the outside, very heelish. Marty hits Spud with a kick in the ring and then he nails a pretty nice swinging DDT. The Hulk praises their facial expressions. Spud uses a ref distraction to hit the code red, which is just a two. Spud's then unable to hit the crossbody as Marty hits him with knees. Straight away, Marty hits the Death Valley driver for the free. Hogan says he has no idea who to pick out the two. Marty gets a crowd fist pump gun that Robbie E would be jealous of, even Hogan's dancing. Marty busts into Hogan's broom closet where he gets a handshake. Gail Kim and Madison Rain are out now for their ladies match. They seem very chilled. Cool of the night is Magnus saying that this isn't going to be easy because Gail Kim and Madison aren't a couple of Manchester slags who've had too many carlings. Hannah and Holly Blossom are here now. Gail has the mic and is very excited to see twins. Madison asks the girls to kiss her feet and the bell rings. Blossoms aren't having it though and one of the Moorish rolls Madison up a couple of times. The other Blossom makes a blind tag and they do a double drop kick. Gail takes advantage though for a ref distraction. Dixie and Hogan are amazed by how good the Blossoms are as Madison does that face buster thing with her legs. The Blossoms double team again with a hip toss and a flapjack. You can tell from Dixie's commentary that she has personal investment in them. Gail Kim wins the match with a roll up whilst one Blossom just stands on the ring apron looking stupid. No mention of that and Hogan and Dixie are impressed. Backstage Hogan thanks them and then they slowly edge away, awkward. All that's left now is the big decision. TNA wrestlers give their opinion on who's going to win. Hogan admits he prejudged the men due to their attitudes and small sizes, but their match changed his mind due to their ring presence. Hogan doesn't want to get rid of anyone. The four contestants are now forced into a porter cabin for the big decision. Hogan and Dixie say they have come to a joint decision, and the winner is Rockstar Spud. He looks like he's going to puke with happiness. He reveals he's now okay with Marty and calls him the best wrestler in the whole of Europe. Easy to say when you've just won. Dixie reveals that despite losing, all of them will go on a TNA tour to get another shot to earn a spot on the roster. So everyone's happy, and that's how British Boot Camp Season 1 ends. But that's not really the end of the story. First up, the Blossoms. They got signed anyway, because I guess they're twins and TNA saw a lot of money in them. They wrestled on the UK tour the following month and made sporadic appearances on TNA programming. They mostly stayed in OVW though, almost seeing out 2013. They seem to have retired from wrestling just after this. If you ask me, they were fine in the ring, but they just didn't have personality. 
They seem way too innocent to be in that kind of environment. They look scared most of the time. And they didn't seem to want to be more sexy, which unfortunately TNA was all about at the time. They'd probably have got on better in today's environment. Now you all know Rockstar Spud's tale. He would show TNA were right to make him the winner of the show. He was a main character on the TNA show up to 2017 when he asked for his release due to TNA trying to lowball him. Nowadays he's better known as Drake Maverick and he's signed to the WWE. But we need to talk about Party Marty. Throughout the show he seemed to be the best all-rounder of the group. I vaguely remember I was pulling for him when I saw it for the first time. So he joined the Blossoms on the UK tour the following month and he had three matches. But on the third match at Wembley, and I was there for this one, I'll never forget it. He has the crowd in the palm of his hands, they're all chanting his name frantically. And he dives to the outside of the ring on Jesse Goddard, and he completely overshoots him and smashes straight into the crowd barrier. And just like that, he was never seen in TNA again. Look, it's hard to know what was real and what wasn't on this show, but an interview of WrestleTalk TV confirmed that the animosity between Spud and Marty was actually real. On another sad note, Marty also didn't end up with Hannah Blossom, so I guess Marty partied a little bit too hard and was the biggest loser on British bootcamp. Marty was with RH for a long time, but they recently ended that relationship due to the speaking out movement. The allegation was that Marty had an inappropriate relationship with a 16 year old girl, and he did not deny this. He said it was all consensual. So that's his career fucked. Let me know if you want me to cover the second series or I'll chop off your knees, there's no need to say please.